Hello there. In this video, I want to calculate the moment of inertia of a uniform spherical shell. Well, hold on a second. I did this moment of inertia calculation last week, right? We basically imagined that this spherical shell was comprised of a bunch of rings, effectively, right? That we could stack up on top of each other. And we exploited our knowledge of the moment of inertia of this simpler ring, right? To basically derive the moment of inertia of this shell. So why are we deriving it again? Well, in physics, it's really important to look at problems from different angles, right? So that we can learn more, expand our knowledge, and basically can confirm that our different understandings of problems are consistent with each other, right? So what I'm saying is in this video, right? Before we use like a cool trick, right? Like we stacked up a bunch of rings. That, that was clever. Good on us. We, we exploited some knowledge. This time, I want to go back to just the definition of moment of inertia and to say, look, so this sphere, right, is the spherical shell is ultimately made up of a bunch of like point like masses. And I'm going to label these masses uh, dm and each one is going to occupy some infinitesimal area element. I'm going to call that dA. And each one of these point-like masses that ultimately build up this shell, right, they're going to be some perpendicular distance from this axis of rotation, from this z-axis. I'm going to call that distance gamma, okay? And just so we're super clear, I'm going to draw like a little projection of gamma onto the xy plane, right? And this is perpendicular to the z-axis. So we have this distance from our axis of rotation. And with these parameters, the moment of inertia of my spherical shell is defined as the integral over my spherical shell of gamma squared dm. This is the definition of moment of inertia, very generally for any rigid body, any continuous rigid body. So is this new perspective going to give us the same result as last week's video? Let's see. So the first thing that we need to do, we know that this gamma here is, you know, some function of like spatial coordinates. So that's not matching our variable of integration dm. So we need to go ahead and fix that first. So again, this sphere is going to have some surface area density. I'll call that sigma. And that is defined as, you know, some dm per some infinitesimal area element dA that each of those dms occupy. Awesome. In which case, we can go ahead and rewrite dm is equal to sigma dA. By the way, what is sigma? Well, let me go ahead and remind us real quick that this spherical shell is going to have some radius r and a total mass capital M. In which case, our mass density we can find by taking the total mass m and divide it by the total surface area of our sphere, 4 pi capital R squared. And remember, this is true because we have a uniform spherical shell. Because it's uniform, we can find the mass density by taking the total mass divided by the total surface area of the sphere. So let's go ahead and plug this right in. We have I is equal to the integral over my sphere of gamma squared, plug this right in, m over 4 pi r squared d a. I'm plugging this right in just for clarity, but of course we know that we can take this constant out. i is equal to m over 4 pi r squared, to take this right out of the integral, over my sphere of gamma squared, and I'm going to leave dA blank for a second. We need to figure out what dA is, right? And in order to do that, we need to think about our coordinate system. All right, so I've brought us back to our little picture here, and we know that each of these little infinitesimal mass elements on, on you know, the surface of this shell are each going to occupy some surface area dA on the surface of the shell but we haven't actually used any coordinates to express dA yet, right? So what coordinates should we use to work with this spherical shell? Well, I think by the name, right, spherical shell, let's use spherical coordinates, right? That's gonna be nice and easy. 
So remember, in spherical coordinates, we can represent the location of any point with three parameters, right? First, you know, some radial distance r, right? But look, we're, we're confined to the surface of this sphere, so we're always going to be at this radius capital R for this shell. So R is going to equal, you know, capital R. Awesome. And then we also have a polar angle theta and an azimuthal angle phi, right? These are our three coordinates. So if we're using spherical coordinates, what is a surface area element dA going to look like? Well, dA is simply going to be equal to, in spherical coordinates, r squared sine theta d theta d phi. Okay, and just in case you need a clarification on why this area element looks like this in uh, spherical coordinates, let me just take, you know, one minute here, right? We can draw out our area element by varying each of our parameters here, keeping the others fixed, okay? So for example, right, first off, R is always going to be fixed. We're always going to be on the surface of the sphere, so that never varies. Okay, next, let's go ahead and vary theta, right, keeping phi fixed. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sweeping down this little sphere here, okay? And we're gonna traverse some like D Theta. Do you see that really clearly? I'm like sweeping down a little bit. I'm just changing d theta. Okay. And then next, I'm going to hold theta fixed and I'm going to sweep out this azimuthal angle d phi. So again, we're holding theta and r fixed and we're just changing phi. So we're sweeping out a little arc, you know, in this kind of circular ring that we're kind of locked in, you know, when theta is fixed. Okay. And so we're kind of going to get once we put this all together, we're going to get a kind of shape that looks like that, a little patch, right? And so this patch, let me go ahead and draw it something like this over here. Okay, this patch. So what's this arc length here, right? We have some radial distance r and we sweep out some d theta. So the arc length is r times d theta, right? Do you see that? And then for this upper part, this is slightly more involved. But you know what? We're going to need this piece of information anyways. Let's do this now. Look, I'm at some length gamma here, right? And now I sweep out this amount d phi, right? So this top part, this top part here, this is going to be gamma d phi. But look, we can already rewrite gamma in terms of our spherical coordinates because we have this triangle here, right? Look at this triangle. Look, I have right here here's my triangle i'm just redrawing it here i have this angle theta i have this radial distance r and i have gamma here what's gamma going to be oh i see gamma is going to be equal to r sine theta right super duper clear right so this gamma here is really r sine theta right and when we take the limit right as d theta and d phi become really really small this kind of curvy patch becomes a square patch effectively right so we can take these r sine theta d phi and r d theta multiply them together and look we're going to pop out r squared sine theta d theta d phi right super simple all right so this is awesome we've killed two birds with one stone here not only do we have our area element da check we also have our distance gamma in terms of our spherical coordinates too awesome we've got everything we need now okay so let me start just by plugging in for da we said this was r squared sine theta d theta d phi that's what we found in this gamma here we also found that this was r sine theta so let's go ahead and rewrite this out and oh my goodness look look how nice this is these r's here are going to cancel right there so let me go ahead and rewrite out i is equal to and now we have d theta d phi we're going to need a double integral okay so we have m over 4 pi double integral r squared sine cubed theta see we have this sine theta squared then times another sine theta perfect d theta d phi okay and again let's be nice and organized let's pull r squared 
right? A constant, let's get that out of the integral. Perfect. Okay, what are the boundaries of integration? Where do theta and phi, how do those range for this sphere? So for theta, theta equals zero starts up here. We need to range theta from zero to pi radians to sweep down this entire sphere, right? And then at each theta, we're going to vary phi from zero to two pi at every one to kind of build up these circles all the way down. And that's how we're going to build up our entire sphere. So theta is going to range from zero to pi and phi is going to range from zero to two pi, right? But notice how this integral has no dependence on phi at all. So integrating with respect to phi is just going to give me a factor of two pi, right? So this kind of integral here is ultimately going to cancel out, you know, and give us two here, right? Two pi, to, you know, two pi over four pi is just a half, right? And so I is equal to m r squared over two integral from zero to pi of sine cubed theta d theta, right? And oh my goodness, this is the exact same integral we got to in last week's video, and it had a value of four thirds. And so this four and two are going to cancel, and we're going to be left with I of our spherical shell is equal to two thirds m r squared, right? And bam, there we go. All right, awesome. And now we feel confident. We're seeing here that using the definition of moment of inertia, using this perspective, we get the exact same result as, you know, we did with the, with the ring stacking method. And so, yay, we're happy about that. Um, if you enjoyed this video, found it helpful, you know, let me know in the comments and consider subscribing to the channel. I, I really do enjoy and appreciate, you know, seeing people getting involved on the channel, getting on board. This is a lot of fun. Um, but other than that, thank you so, so much for watching.